good morning, church. Hey, can you take a moment and say hi to somebody next to you today? All right. I was feeling a little bit nostalgic this morning or this week, so we're going to do some older songs this morning if you do, okay? So come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your As you are to worship, oh, just as you are before your God. We're going to sing that again. So come, now is the time to worship. Yeah. 
get those tears you know we grew up in places where those tears came from us from harsh things that happened some really nasty things that happened in our lives Holy Spirit said no the love of heaven came down and she worshiped him and those tears were from that That's what all we do this morning is open up our hearts and just allow his truth to set us free. Allow him to set us free. And what a great Sunday that would be, huh? So can we just take a moment? And just the, the way you know how is just open up your heart and just invite him in. comfort and to bring rest.
for me with the melody cause you surround me with a song of deliverance for my enemies till all my fears are come on let's sing that again you you unravel me with a melody Cause you surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer
soak that in this morning. Father, we think we're thankful that you call us your own. That we're your kids. Yes, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for inviting us in, Jesus.
Just your presence in our lives, God. And I pray for all of us in this place, Lord, that just wherever we're at, God, that I just know that your word says that if we seek you, we will find you. And that you won't turn your back on us and that you're here for us. And so just wherever you're at this morning, I invite you, would you seek him? And the fact that you're even in a building that has a cross on the wall, that means you're doing something right. You're seeking him. And he is faithful and he'll, he'll reveal himself to you. He'll meet you exactly where you're at. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Hey, before we greet one another this morning, we're going to do um, a little family business. We're going to ask uh, Marcy to come up. And we're going to honor our Sunday school teachers this morning because our kids are so awesome. Good morning. In case you don't know me, my name is Marcy. I work with the um, True North Kids team here. And before we get to the kids, I do want to make an announcement about Trunk and Treat. Um, I was supposed to wear a costume. Today I'm dressed as a Sunday school teacher, <laughs> which will, may actually be my costume if I can't pull anything together. So what I need to say to you is we need your help. This is um, one of our biggest community outreach events of the year where people actually come to our building, people who may not ever come to a church to this building, they'll be out there and they will play games with their kids and they will get candy and they will be laughing and they will see us all having so much fun. And on the wall, they will see that God is here and we honor God and we are kind and he loves us. And they'll see Bible verses and they'll see what the kids are learning. And maybe, just maybe, one thing will stick. That's my prayer for this, for all the work, <laughs> for everything it takes. My prayer is just that maybe one thing would stick for these kids. So what we need from you is we need you to sign up to help, to run a booth, play a game. It's inside, it's not outside, so you won't get rained on. Um, we also need people, I made a list. We need someone or two people in the parking lot with those lighted swords from Star Wars, what are they called? Lightsabers. Lightsabers. <laughs> <sighs> to direct cars. <laughs> I don't watch Star Wars, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lucas, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need someone in the kitchen to make coffee and hot chocolate and make sure that it's full. We need um, a greeter to stand outside or even um, to let people know inside what's going on. And we need someone um, Wednesday during the day, hopefully Pam and Alex will come back from Hawaii, um, Wednesday during the day to help Pastor Alex with the lights out here around the trees. So if you're available Wednesday late morning, early afternoon-ish when they get here. Um, please note that on the sign-up sheet. After service, Adrian will be standing in back with the clipboard, so don't run away from her. Go towards her. 
and sign up, please. Thank you. Okay, next, we're going to honor the teachers. So, Kim, can you please come help me? We have 16 people who helped with the last teaching session, um, and we made them these, um, actually, Adrian baked these muffins, put them in these boxes, and these labels say, there's muffin like a great teacher. <laughs> and it also says, muffin to do but appreciate you. <laughs> so I'm going to call your name. And if you're one of these people, please come forward because I don't want to eat all these muffins. OK, Chuck, Trish, Claire, Libby, Kim, Afiz, Terry, Michael, Pete, Tammy, Tim, Krista, Jordan, and Eric. Here comes Tammy. Oh, and me. <laughs> So thank you. And next time signups come around, you would get an excellent muffin if you serve. So keep that in mind. This, I'm going to pray for the kids. You pray for the kids? Good. Did you want to do that? No. Okay. I have prayed enough today. I think she should pray. Don't you think yeah. she should pray? <laughs> okay. So if there's a kid near you, if they don't want to be touched, don't touch them. Just put your hand out to them. Um, because we want to bless these kids. Jesus, these kids, just bless them. Just lift them up. Just let them know, not in their brains, but in their hearts, that you are there for them, that you love them, that you are never going to leave them, that you have great plans for them and a hope for a future, and that they can do all things through you because you strengthen them. And let the parents know that they're on the front lines. They're taking all the flaming arrows, but they are not alone. They are not standing in this alone, that all these people, all these people in this church, we lift the parents up and we lift each other up because we are not alone. I pray that those kids, there's two kids who gave their hearts to Jesus last week and we are celebrating with them and Jesus is celebrating in heaven and that they would take these lessons that they're learning here into their schools and into their homes and into their friends and their sports and whatever else they do and that they would shine the light that this world needs. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, kids, you can take off and go see your Sunday school teachers. I've heard some of you are having snacks, so it's going to be awesome. The rest of you, can you stand up and greet one another this morning? Say hi to somebody next to you. All right. Good morning, family. It's good to see you all. It's been a good Sunday. I'm excited to give a good report to mom and dad. 
All right. It's always such a blessing to see how, what a great family we have and how <laughs> mom and dad, Pam and Alex are my parents, I'm Adrian, hi. Um, they can go on vacation and they can be blessed and be relaxed and that this church runs like a well-oiled machine because we are all on the same team. We love each other and uh, we have a lot of grace and I am just really proud of you guys. So you guys are awesome. Um, and I love the kids. That's, ooh, ooh. It's just so fun to have them in here and do real worship and let them see um, how this family worships and um, help them to see and understand and grow and learn in all the different ways that we can worship God. Um, it's such an honor. So we are going to take, start with taking our offering just as to keep um, our tithes and our offerings. So just keep this church going, keep this family going. And so, Ashes, if you want to come forward, Lord, thank you so much for this day. And thank you for the time that we've gotten to spend together as a family. Um, I just thank you that you sustain us. I thank you that you not only meet our needs, but while we're waiting for a need to be met, you sustain that hard season while we are waiting for you to meet our needs. So God, thank you for your grace. Even when it feels like we're alone, we know that we're never alone, that our feelings are not what matters, but it's the truth is what matters, God, and that you are good and that we honor you and that we are so blessed to be called your children. And because of that, we want to give everything that we have back to you because we know it all originates in you. So Lord, multiply these tithes and these offerings as we honor you and we thank you and we exalt you for how good you are. In your name, amen. amen. So ushers, if you want to pass the baskets. Um, we've got a lot of great things going on this fall and there's many things you can read in your bulletin. I just want to say, ladies, did any of you attend the get our first ever Woven Gatherings this weekend? Grace, how was it? It was great. So we had a dinner and we had two brunches and I've gotten some really good feedback. So I'm excited. And just so you know, ladies, if you weren't able to capture it this round, we're going to be doing it again in December. So be on the lookout for that. So we'll have another dinner, another brunch, just time to be together, meet together, eat some really delicious food, um, talk about God and just go home and encourage. It's a short, nice, sweet time. I'm excited for that. Um, coming up on Saturday, November 3rd, is our Parents' Night Out. I believe this is the last one of 2018. So parents, grandparents, sign up online. Bring your kids. They'll hang out in the module. There's a lot of great um, team that loves kids and takes great care of our kids. Um, from 4 to 7 p.m. on Saturday, November 3rd. So again, sign up online. Do it. So worth it. Um, the last announcement that I'm going to make today is going to be for the fight night with Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott. I'm sure you guys have been hearing a lot about this. Hopefully you've seen the signs everywhere. Um, this is going to be a really great date night. Um, it is going to be fun, but it's also going to be meaningful and powerful. And I promise you will not leave without at least one nugget, if not 900 nuggets, that, of truth that you can use in your own relationship. So I really want to encourage you guys to come. This is also an awesome opportunity to invite friends, Christian or non-Christian. If you're married, you know that there's things that we all get to work on forever being married. So that's true whether you love God or you don't yet know God. So this is something I really want to encourage you all to invite your friends. We've put up signs in Safeway. We've got to sign up at our kids' school. Um, there's just a lot of great ways that we can invite each other. So I want to encourage you to do that as well um, as come yourself. We have a short video I want to show you just to get you a little bit excited about what's happening. Why do we fight with the person that we love the most? We use all of our brain all the time. That's how it works. For men, it's whoa, not like whoa. that. No. <laughs> yeah, hey. <laughs> So we're going to take a little tour through Problemville together. <laughs> huh? Perception is at the heart of our conflict. Yeah. We each have our own style about how we approach conflict. These things work. We're going to show you how to keep conflict at a minimum and how to uh, manage conflict when it does arrive.
like that. Let's get ready to rumble. Yeah. I don't know if that's what I would say, but I would say this is going to be really great because it's true conflict. Kids, money, homes, cars, how you spend your time, where you're going on vacation. It is just a nonstop litany no matter how long you've been married. Um, so again, please come register and invite your friends. Lastly, I want to introduce Daryl. He is going to be our guest speaker today, Mr. Mayor. Woo, Daryl Eidinger, come on up, sir. I'm excited to have him here today. Um, he is a fantastic speaker. If you have not had him speak before, he is a pastor. He is a mayor of Edgewood, right? Right. Yes, okay. Uh, I was like, I've never been to Edgewood, but it's gonna be great because Daryl's your mayor there. Um, so we are thankful that you are here today, that you choose to take the trek to come all the way to be part of our church family. It's an honor. And it's an honor for me to be able to be here as Can well. Can have fun? All right, thank Good you. Good luck. <laughs> I feel like there's a big hollow echo, am I right? Well, because I was here. That's because you were here? Are you a big hollow echo? <laughs> Leave that one alone. I want to thank you guys for being able to uh, allow me to come and speak today. One of the things, I have two shameless plugs that I want to do. The first one is, you know, Kevin and, and the worship team come here once a month on Thursday nights. And... If you don't come here on Thursday nights, it's noticed. And it's noticed because we have more visitors on Thursday nights than we have regular people that attend here. If you don't come, you know, I, I think Kevin did the old set for me because he thinks I'm, I'm old, but uh, I, I love it. And, you know, I remember when church, I remember, how many of you remember when worship at church ran between 45 minutes and an hour? You guys remember that? Oh, you're in the minority if you look around. But you know, when you come on that Thursday night, you get to worship for an hour and a half, and you walk out of here totally refreshed and, and, and rebuilt, and it's just a wonderful time. The other thing I want to plug is, did you know that you guys can actually see the sermons on the website? And I only want to say that for two reasons. Two weeks ago, I'm sitting in the, in the comfort of my living room because I wasn't really well, and, uh, and I watched Dana talk about what he was talking about. Last week, I think Alex shared a really important message. And if you missed last week, you should go online and go take a look at that. I mean, I'm not a big electronics guy. We won't have any overheads today because I just, I, I know how they work. I know why they work. And I just don't work well with them. So that being said, if you didn't bring a Bible, you can get your device out or whatever you want to do. But in Matthew 25... Jesus tells us a story about the ten virgins. I'm not talking about society today or any of those kinds of things. But here, here it is, he uses a Jewish wedding custom. And, and it comes in response to the disciples' question, how will we know? What will be the sign that you are coming and the end of the age? And in the previous chapter, Jesus had laid out what will take place in the future. You know, wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes, false prophets, deception, so much fake news. You know, it will all be like hell is broken loose. That's what he says. And everyone all over the world will panic. And many will turn away from their faith. And men's hearts will be failing with fear and with terror. Jesus predicted worldwide terrorism in the end days. So if you're looking around, I'm not, an, I'm not going to preach an end days sermon on you today because I, you know, no one knows. But the good news is, you know, that he had said to us that we need to not be alarmed. We need to watch out. We need to hold on and again, keep watch. Though we don't know the hour and the twinkling of an eye, there will be no time to make a call or to tweet or to text anybody about the, and when Jesus comes back, Jesus will come with an unexpected surprise. The good news is our present world is, is prime for Jesus' coming. So Jewish wedding protocol kind of went like this. This is kind of scary to me as I went through it. A young suitor would pour a glass of wine for the woman he wanted to marry. And if she drank the cup, the answer was yes. 
Caution, ladies, don't go on date night. Because it just, you know, I mean, I think about that. And he says, then he would give gifts to the father. Where has that tradition gone south? Because it would have been really nice if that has sort of continued. And before he, leaving, he would announce, I am going to prepare a place for you. And I will return for you when it is ready. So he'd go home to his father's house, his home, and he'd build a honeymoon suite there. And which had to be approved by his father. Your father was like my father, never meet the standard. But, but if, asked, you know, if asked about the date of his wedding, his only reply would be, only my father knows. Only my father knows. Sue, these pages don't turn as easily as they did at home. They are stuck together. You know, I'm going to do something. This is... This is not an Alex approach, but I need two places to work from. So meanwhile, the bride, meanwhile, the bride was making herself ready and waiting for the return. She would wear a veil when she went out to show that she was spoken for. It represented sanctification or dedication. And from that moment on, the bride was set aside for her suitor. She would keep her veil, a lamp, and other things close to her bed. The lamp had to be an outdoor lamp. We don't have distinction in some of that stuff, but you guys probably have indoor and outdoor stuff that you use. And it would have to be bright enough that it would give light in the dark. The Greek word lampo means to beam, radiate brilliantly, to shine. And only one lamp is sufficient spiritually to travel to the wedding, to guide one's way through life, God's own holy word, his instruction book. But the Hebrew word near, N-E-E-R, means to glisten. It takes it deeper. It identifies as a personal connection with God. According to the scripture, when our lamp is lit, we are connected to him. You know, but when our lamp goes out, that connection is lost. So her bridesmaids, which were mostly like these ten virgins were, they were waiting and they had, had to have oil in their lamps and ready to go. And then at the night time, the bridegroom would come for his bride. Interesting, night time. But followed by the procession through the streets at nightfall, they'd be working their way down to call the bride. Each person had to have their own lamp or their own torch. And when the groom and his friends got close to the bride's house, they would give a shout and blow the shofar and let, let her know that it was ready. I mean, you know, everybody in town probably says, whose car is that? You know, but, you know, that whole thing about everybody was ready and they're ready and the bridesmaids would arise and they'd trim their lamps and run out to light the way. Trim meant to put something in proper order. It's kind of like the sailing term, to trim the sails. And each was to put their lamp to the best order that they could so that the moment that they would be ready when the time came to light the way. The festivities might last for several days and they would formally get underway at the groom's house. Each person had their own lamp to enter into the celebration. And would require an occasional re-soaking to maintain the flame, if you've ever seen the old style lanterns, throughout the celebration. But anybody without a lamp would be considered a wedding crasher. Now, so these are the transition, but this gives us, you know, there's additional traditions that go with this. But that's sufficient backdrop, so if you'd open your Bibles with me to Matthew 25, or I need to be more correct, if you have a device that your Bible is on, you can do that as well. We used to be offended in the old days that people would have their cell phones in church. And now, you know, I've got a Bible stuff, you know, on my, you know. So this is the one I'm using. I'm in the NIV. If your translation is close, if you don't have one, trust that I'll read it correctly. And in Matthew uh, 25, verse 1, it says, at, the, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. And five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was long time in coming, 
and they were all became drowsy and fell asleep. Then at midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for your lamps, for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived and the virgins who were ready, went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the hour or the day. It was the oil in the in the the jars of that five virgins that they carried that distinguish the wise from the foolish. The oil represents the person of the Holy Spirit. The promised ones given to each believer who comes and who dwells in. The five wise virgins represent the church, the bride of Christ, having declared their faith and receiving salvation and the Holy Spirit. They eagerly await for the bridegroom. Say that with me. They eagerly await for the bridegroom. I think this is important in our lives today. How eager are we? How eager are we in our lives? You know, they were all set. They trimmed their lamps. Their flasks were full. They understood the value of the oil to bring light in the darkness. Symbolizing the spirit was infused. Their spirit was infused with God's spirit. There has to be a connection that happens with his people, not just saved and walking on the same plane that we used to walk on, but when Jesus Christ comes into our life, when the Holy Spirit comes into us, we are a different person, and we theoretically cannot even separate that out. Isaiah 40 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? God is a good God. The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. And young men stumble and fall. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God gives power and grace to those who need it, who wait upon the Lord, who spend oil time. See, we're designed from the very beginning to be infused with the Holy Spirit, to be filled, to be permeated, to be soaked, to be marinated. Lots of those words. I, I always like to bring a bag with me when I talk. I'm sort of like the bag lady, but I'm the bag man. So I, I wanted to do a little demonstration this is just an Alka-Seltzer, a glass and water. And see, they don't have anywhere for you to do this with too many hands. But by the way, Dana, it was fun watching you in my jammies, you know, <laughs> watching that whole sermon. It was good. So anyway, this would just be water, proof that it's just water. Yeah, you can fill those clear bottles with anything clear. So, it says wait. So, I'm going to show, you know, everybody remembers this, plop, plop, fizz, fizz, if you're old enough. You know, it's, you know, here it is. And you see that at some point, depending on the temperature, try this with boiling water. It really goes, Phew. But anyway, what happens is as I put the Alka-Seltzer into the glass, you see that the water and the Alka-Seltzer become one. You know, when, when we let the Holy Spirit deal in our lives, we become one with God and one with the Holy Spirit. And we come, sort of become infused. And you know, this is still even drinkable. But my, my point is, 
you can't, once this becomes one, it cannot be separated. And you'd be hard-pressed to pick the Alka-Seltzer back out of here. And that's how we need to be with our relationship with God. You need to be hard-pressed that anyone could separate you from your ongoing relationship with God. So, the five foolish virgins had focused on other things. They were not preparing. They could put, kept putting off their trust in God and receiving oil. And this parable points out that not all who say they believe are Christians. They may have liked the comfort and the well-being of the community of faith without really having a love for Christ. The party to them was more exciting than waiting for the bridegroom. They gave no priority to the oil. And until their lamps were going out, and it was their only way to get into the celebration. And when they say to them, give us some of your oil, our lamps are out. They were really saying, give us some of your relationship with the Holy Spirit. See, here's the point. You can't borrow somebody else's relationship with God. You can't get that from someone else. That has to be your own. One person's faith cannot save another. Although I will say lots of people prayed for me a long time before I got saved. A long time. And I'm thankful for that faithfulness. But they still couldn't get me saved through some kind of proxy vote. The wise virgin said, go out and get your own. So the foolish virgins, they race off with, with what little flame they have left to go buy some oil. It's like running out of gas. That fuel light is blank, blinking on your dash going empty, empty, empty. And you're going, I can make it. I can make it. And you're leaning forward into it trying to think, well, maybe if I just push a little harder, maybe I can get there. You know, ever since they put in that light in my car, I have never run out of gas since. <laughs> never run out of gas since. But of course... I'm going to give you, my, my father was one of those parable kind of guys to me. And he says, you know, it's just as cheap to run on the top half of the tank as it is to run on the bottom half of the tank. So you're hoping you'll get there. Maybe I can coast in. But while they were away, while they were away, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, comes to those who are ready. And he went in and they went in and the door was shut. And in the story, afterwards, they go, Lord, Lord. It's an intimate term. It's said, come on, really, open up to us. But he answered, truly, I say, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, so you'll neither know the day nor the hour. See, the obvious point is this. Jesus is coming. We don't know when. It'll be a surprise. Will we be ready? That's the question that all of us have to have. Let me paraphrase the story another way. They all looked ready. They all looked ready. They all fit in well with the crowd. They all brought their Bibles. They all worshiped together. They seemed to listen intently. But not all were really serious about the return of the bridegroom. They looked the part. But only those with the oil, with the relationship, went in. You know, I, I was asked to give a, a title to this, I, 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 so I, I named it The Oil Crisis. <laughs> you you got to pick names, you know, I didn't have to title any of my sermons in the old days. We didn't have to have titles for the video and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I recognize in my life, and it's, you know, as I, as I talk to you about this, I, I was sharing with... Uh, somebody this morning about how, you know, I had a, a dozen sermons that I was going to bring here. I mean, you know, if you're retired, you never really retire. And I had a dozen things that I've worked on it. But this is where I ended up because it struck me for myself more than anything else. You know, where do we get a little bit lax in where we are in our relationship with God? Where do we say, Jesus loves me and that's good enough? You know, where do we not quite on mark with how trim our lamps are? Are we on our A game or does our B game really work? I don't think so. It's the one thing that I, you know, it's one thing for us to believe that Christ died for the sins of the world. I mean, we all, you know, Jesus, that's something you believe. But it's entirely different to believe that Christ died for me and then rose again 
to live in me through the person of the Holy Spirit. The born-again spirit life is a product of both. It's a product of the Holy Spirit activity and my human spirit response. It doesn't happen one way. If we're going to be ready for Christ's return, we must believe that Jesus Christ literally was crucified, died, and raised from the dead. It's more than just a good story that you've been given the gift of grace, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's an important part of everything. And what's your spirit's response? Are you making yourself ready? The Holy Spirit infusion changes our hearts. It changes our relationships. It changes our careers, our interests, our goals, everything. If you give the Holy Spirit control, he will lead you. He will grow you in every good thing. But it requires oil time. I tell people, you know, I, I, she refers to me as the mayor. I, I don't like that in particular because I don't like to bring attention to that. But, you know, I failed at retirement. I want you to know, if, if all of you people who are waiting for, for retirement, thinking, ah, that day comes, I'll be able to stop doing everything and I'll be able to retire. Dane will probably be able to say that. I was busier in retirement than I ever was at work. You know, I, and I just, and I failed at it, so it was easier to go back to work. <laughs> it, it really was. But, you know, we are designed to be infused with what the Holy Spirit has for us. It's not our own power. We cannot, we cannot will it. We will not, you know, everything about this. We are powerless to do God's will on our own. So we need oil time. So Jesus instructed, in fact, he commanded those first disciples. And I'm looking at my watch. I don't have one, but there's a clock behind. I always know because I don't have a watch, you know, it's really rude to turn around and look. So everybody turn around and look at the clock in the back. See, it doesn't even work. You guys all have watches. But that being said, you know, when the, when the, the speaker looks at his watch, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. You all thought he was getting close. Oh, I only have a few minutes left. Wrong. <laughs> anyway, he, he, Jesus instructed me. He said, wait. It says in Acts 1, it says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Wait for him. Wait on him. Let your spirit get infused with his spirit. Where? says, in Jerusalem, a place of peace. Anywhere that you're not distracted or interrupted, God will not compete with others, other people, and he will not compete with your busyness or your good excuses. We all have them. Currently, I have a 60-hour work week as mayor of the city. Boy, I signed up for that. I serve on two boards. I belong to three different organizations. I work a side job just to keep my grandson going well. And I have a growing family and friends that I'm committed to. I struggle to live out anything beyond my to-do list. But I can't afford not to have oil time. Can't afford it. I can't borrow someone else's oil. I have to have my own. And I know that when I don't make way for it, when I don't hang out with him, when I don't take time with him, life isn't the same. And the one thing you can't get back is time. Just no way to get it back. How long do you wait? Wait until you're infused. Wait until you feel like the power of the Spirit has really affected you. you know, respond. Listen to his counsel. How many people have heard Jesus really tell them something and then done exactly the opposite? Don't, don't do it. You know, I, I always tell people when you find life isn't going quite right, you know, go back to the spot that you said no to Jesus 
and say yes to that question that you had for him and then move from that point on. Lots of us have said no to Jesus inadvertently, indirectly, you know. When you're in oil time, when you spend enough time with him, you know the difference. He won't let you go long when you've made a mistake. He would, you know, it isn't Jesus' intent to hang you out there and see how far out there you can get before you, you really come rolling back. Jesus really wants to have that time with. Listen to him. Take his hand. Follow him. Go where the Spirit is leading. Trust and obey. The results, you know, and, and trust him in the, in the results or in the consequences. Not everything that Jesus has told me to do ends up being like one of those great shows with a happy ending on Channel 19. It isn't like that on the Hallmark Channel. I guess it's not Channel 19 everywhere. It's not like that necessarily. But you know, when you trust in God and you trust the answer and you do the thing he told you to do, you'll know that even if there are consequences, he knows where they're going. Live joyfully. I always like this one. I always like the Christian smile. You know, that's the guy, that's the guy I want to meet. Yeah, Mr. Grumpy, you know. I'm not good at this, by the way. I don't smile a lot. But, you know, you know, we have to live joyfully. We have to be excited about our time with Jesus. You know, I try it in the morning. How many people get up first thing, they're in their Bible for a half hour? Good for you. I don't even drink coffee, and I can tell you it doesn't work for me in the morning. But I do find a time in the morning. I find after I get to work, I go to work early, set myself up, get all the fires put out, and then I close my door at the office and I spend some time with God. You have to figure out how you're going to do that, but it has to be time that you do, and it has to work for you. Don't use my plan. Don't say, well, Pastor Darrell said go to the work, get in your office, get all the fires put out, close the door, because it may not work for you. <laughs> and then keep step. Keeping step is important. Go with God's pace. I found that God is never early, never late, and never too fast, never too slow. He's right on time. And you know the thing that I found is if you like adventure, hang in there with God. He will give you some. It'll be some of the least expected stuff that you'll ever see in your life. You know, the word said in, in Jude, build ourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit keeping ourselves in, in God's love as we wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring us eternal life. You know, Sue had in here, she said, well, you should talk about dancing with him. I'm not a dancer. You could probably tell that I don't have rhythm either. But the thing I can tell you is we were really committed. I like music. I love music. I'm old enough to be a Beach Boys fan with the original group, and I still go see them every time they're at the Puyallup Fair, along with 30,000 other people, because that's what kind of a crowd they draw. But that being said, one year we decided, Sue and I decided that my dancing was so poor that we would take lessons. <laughs> now, I want you to know there's probably nothing further down my bucket list than dance lessons. Some of you looking around probably can join me in that. It's not on your to-do list ever. So we took group lessons, three or four group lessons that we had, and I learned one thing. If I'm going to be embarrassed, I'm not going to be embarrassed in a group. <laughs> and so then we took private lessons. And I want you to know the word arduous and this lesson seem to go in the same sentence for me. But you know, over time, over time, I actually got somewhat better. My wife is a saint because her feet had bruises all over them. <laughs> but over time, you will learn how to do the things that you're not comfortable with. I think if you're not comfortable with your free time with God, it's time to start. It's time to ask the Holy Spirit, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? How does this work, Holy Spirit? How do I become the person that I want to become? Let's pray. 
Thank you, Lord, for this parable and for the saving, empowering truths it holds. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you send your Holy Spirit to dwell in our spirits. We want to be among the wise with our lamps lit, preparing for your coming. And do a fresh work in my heart, Lord, in all our hearts, Lord. Since this is the kind of life we've chosen, the life of the Spirit, we want to make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but that we work it out with the implications in every day, in every detail of our lives. So wake us up, revive us, stir us in fresh ways, fill us until our spirits are infused with your spirit. We want to keep in step with you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. So, if you need oil, or for more oil to come, let's not have an oil crisis in your lives. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, this would be a great day. The time is now. It's the first step. The Holy Spirit will take it from there into eternity. Your part's easy. You just say, Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. You rose to give me new life and a new spirit. That's all it is. That's all you have to do. That's the start. But you know, the other thing I want to do, you know, there's a tremendous prayer team in this church. If you somehow feel like you've gotten out of sync with where you need to be with God, please come forward. Let somebody pray for you. You know, prayer is the answer to whatever your question is. So take the time. You know, I, I ended early. I had an extra five minutes I could tell more stories with. But I'm not going to do that. Because I really feel, I think Kevin set it up beautifully this morning. I think, you know, the old worship songs where you just ask yourself, where am I? What am I doing? How am I doing with God? So if that's you, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you know, I hope that uh, you would consider that an option. A real viable option while there's still time. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>